leftover students, my name is Joanna, one of your next gen interns. And before you do anything, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss a thing. And we're all over social media. You can find us on Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, and Facebook. Now, here's this funny TikTok I found. such a great video go ahead and let us know in the description below and if you haven't been keeping up with our worship videos no worries you can find a link of our worship playlist down in the description below or in the card above and we're so excited to let you guys know that we're finally having our student services upstairs in the new student auditorium you can go up the stairs find us in student auditorium a and we'll be there to hang out with you guys we can't wait to see you there now to this week's sermon Tito. I'm one of the next-gen pastors here at Westover, and we're starting a brand new series called Mental Health. Now, mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, how we feel, how we act, and it affects how we handle stress, how we relate to others, and how we make our choices. The truth is, mental health is extremely important at every stage of our lives, from the childhood years to the teenage years, all the way onward to your adulthood. It's never something that you really grow out of. And we thought that this topic of mental health is so important that we wanted to give the entire month to talking about this. And what we've done is we've interviewed some healthcare professionals. These are people that spent years in universities studying mental health, worked in their own private practices, encountered mental health on a personal level, and all of whom have been in the trenches with other people, your age, young adults and students, and have helped people through it. So if you've ever dealt with anxiety or stress or depression or just had too much on your shoulders that you couldn't handle, our prayer is that this will really, really help you. So today we're going through an interview that I did with Miss Jackie Hernandez. Now her and her family have gone to Westover for many years. Her, um, her son and daughter graduated a couple years ago. They're both at university. One was on the creative team, one was on the worship team. So. I want you to check out this little introduction about who Miss Jackie is. I have been a licensed professional counselor since 2017. Prior to that time, I served as a guidance counselor and I had the pleasure of working with 7th through 12th graders. I have a private practice named Revelation Counseling Services and I feel that that is the place that God has been training me for uh, for my entire life now looking yeah. back at every experience I've gone through and so I just feel very blessed to be in a position to help individuals um, students their parents young adults uh, couples uh, and so I just uh, I'm very privileged to uh, to be serving our community that way so getting the chance to talk to someone who's been working with teenagers for a really long time I wanted to do whatever I could, ask some of the questions that I figured you would want to ask if you were the one getting to sit next to an expert like her. So check it out. But what do you wish every student knew about mental health? I would say be aware, be self-aware and understand that whatever you're going through, you're not alone. Developmentally, this is the stage in which students are experiencing a surge of emotion. Uh, I, I speak to very few um, uh, elementary students who might feel the emotion of betrayal. But going into middle school and even in high school, that is something that maybe a, a five-year-old was oblivious to, but yet a 13-year-old is very aware of that. And so it's important to know that not everything that happened, the 
frontal lobe is not fully developed, there is this tendency to feel like everything is my fault. If parents are in the kitchen arguing, it's my fault my parents are arguing. If uh, something happens at school or relationally with, with your friends, it's my fault that my friends aren't talking to me. Without any inclination or, or awareness that it's possible that that person is going through a difficult time. And therefore, whatever the circumstances there doesn't have anything to do with, with me. Notice a couple things. Developmentally, you're not a preschool anymore. You're like, duh, I know that. Developmentally, you're not an early elementary age kid anymore. That means that there are actual changes going on in your brain right now that are affecting everything about how you see and process your world. Even your emotions hit differently at this age. Some things that didn't really used to bother you when you were younger now can bother you a whole, whole lot. And I want you to notice what Miss Jackie said. Lovingly, she said, it's not all about you. And if we could have empathy for others and just think maybe, maybe somebody else is going through some of the same kinds of stuff I'm going through, at home with their parents, at school with their friends, the same struggles, all that, then we can choose to feel not so offended and not so betrayed when it feels like our friends aren't there for us. Y'all, that's, that's huge. Miss Jackie just has a way when she talks that it feels like you just got slapped upside the head. You know, like you just got slapped upside the head, but it feels like she was just patting your head. You know what I'm saying? But there it is. It's not all about you. Sometimes when parents do have a lot of struggles, whether it's financial or relational, students tend to assume that burden uh, a responsibility and so then they start playing the role of managing their parents emotions or, or, or protecting uh, their siblings and that's rough it's heavy so if you think about it and if you're aware of that what if the friend who's not talking to you anymore is going through the same thing and therefore not answering your text because there's so many things on that student's mind that you are an afterthought and it's not because of you but it's because of what that other person is going through so learning to be self-aware and and just understand that not everything that is going on in that moment of distress is about you just remember you're not alone um, and chances are the people around you are also in as much distress or feel overwhelmed as you do jackie keeps using the term self-aware now let me explain what self-awareness is for a minute. Being self-aware or having self-awareness is being conscious of your own character, feelings, motives, and desires. It's taking time to really understand yourself. Why that thing made you so angry. Why certain things really bother you or certain people. <laughs> and why you do the things you do, even the good things. And it's understanding how you tend to react and what kinds of things really, really trigger you. You see, all of these questions are self-awareness questions. They help you better understand your world and process what's going on around you, the good, the bad, and the blah. And when we become more self-aware, we become less self-centered. Let me say that again. When we become more self-aware, we become less self-centered because we're better able to understand the people around us. So understanding that there has to be a shift in our, in our focus from being self-centered to mm -hmm. having real empathy for the people around us, that maybe they're going through what we're going through, or maybe they're going through something that I'm just unaware of. Mm -hmm. And that what I'm seeing on the outside as disrespect or betrayal or, or feeling neglected could be just a symptom of something much deeper and heavier. So. Exactly, exactly. And, and trauma affects people in different ways, okay? And so not all trauma is bad. Trauma can actually help to build resiliency in people. But if, if an individual cannot distinguish a real threat from a perceived threat, a, a perceived threat is extremely dangerous because in the brain it locks that that sensation in that moment. And so our body, our, our brain will literally go into a fight or flight mode, engaging our uh, stress hormones, which 
run havoc on our bodies. And so one thing that a lot of students don't recognize is that sometimes you don't, you misread certain signals in your body, like stomach aches, headaches, uh, just headache, uh, a body pressure or body aches as, as, as a physical symptom when it's really a somatic symptom or manifestation of stress or anxiety or depression. Wow, did you catch that? Miss Jackie said if we're not self-aware, if we haven't taken the time to pay attention to ourselves, sometimes we may be experiencing physical symptoms that are actually being caused by something going on in our minds. We may go through stress, anxiety, and depression as a result of our thoughts. In other words, you may have a stomach ache and it's not because you ate something that you're allergic to, but it's because you're stressed out about something going on at home. And you may have a headache, not because you didn't eat enough breakfast, but because there's something really burdensome weighing on your mind. And she even said, a perceived threat can be just as dangerous as a real threat because our minds and our bodies have trouble knowing the difference. Y'all, that's part of the problem when we worry and worry and worry and we get stuck in these patterns of negative thinking. So what you're saying is that there are certain signals that our body gives off just to let us know that we're going through something a little deeper. Could you speak into that a little bit more? What are some of those symptoms that we can be aware of that indicate, hey, there's something a little deeper going on? Absolutely. God created us with an internal emergency alert system. And so we have this tiny little part of our brain called the amygdala. And in that center, uh, deep within our brain are these um, signals that will inform the body of stress, of, 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 of alert. Uh, whether it is a real threat, such as the neighbor's dog is loose and they're very aggressive and they're running toward you and all of a sudden the, the, the amygdala is engaged and at that moment your executive functioning skills, your frontal lobe just goes out of whack and you can't think straight. So you lose your focus, but you're trying to figure out, do I run or do I stand really still? Um, or is the threat just something perceived like uh, hearing noises and it reminding you of a horrible storm, you know, when you were younger. And so among those stress hormones is cortisol. And when that hits the stomach acids, uh, that panic, that, that sense of, of nausea that just overwhelms and that, that cramping feeling, it's overwhelming at times. Maybe someone feels like they want to throw up or they don't want, they have no appetite uh, or they, they get caught in mouth. They get really, really sticky and Maybe their, their breathing becomes shallow because all of this blood is surging down to the legs to get ready to run because, you know, if, if it's a real threat, you got to book it, right? Um, but headaches can be a sign of, of this type of, of, of alert to stress. Um, chest pains, not being able to breathe. Asthma. Asthma can actually be triggered by a panic attack. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, our, our bodies will inform us of something that's off that sometimes is actually happening in our thoughts. So it's not a, a medical issue. It's not a health issue or, or a gastrointestinal issue. It's a thought issue. <laughs> Y'all, that's so crazy. Now, I want you to hear these words from David. Now, you know the story of David. He grew up a little Israeli boy in a, in a family that owned a bunch of sheep, and he took care of the sheep, and he was kind of the runt of the family. And sometimes there were moments where his family wouldn't even invite him to family things. So he went through a lot of ups and downs in his life, even in his early life, and way more if you keep reading the Bible. But I want you to hear what he said in Psalm 139, 14. He said, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. And then I love the way the ESV translation says the same thing. It says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it well. Y'all, God designed your bodies this way 
to give us signals when we're trying to handle too much or when a situation is too stressful for us. But over time, when we ignore these signals over and over and over again and don't get help, that puts us at risk. And remember what Miss Jackie said, a perceived threat can be just as dangerous as a real threat because our minds and our bodies have trouble knowing the difference. And here's my hope for you today, that if you're going through something, that you'll tell someone, that you'll talk to somebody. Now, we know not every time you have a headache is it a sign of anxiety or every time you feel nauseous or every asthma attack is a sign of stress. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what Miss Jackie's saying either. But that's why self-awareness is so important. Getting to know yourself better, getting to understand yourself better, then when you're going through something that is so much worse than normal, you can process it with someone who knows you and who loves you. And sometimes we're just so shy. Sometimes we hold it all in because we think that we're too big of a burden for everyone else. But friends, it's so important that you talk to someone about what's going on on the inside because you're so important to us and you're so important to God and you are too important to keep these things to yourself. So how do we do that? How do we figure out what's going on on the inside? What are some, maybe some tips to like being more self-aware? How do we learn to ask the right questions to really peel back the layers and figure out what's going on? Internally, start challenging your thoughts. Over time though, if we don't learn how to challenge our negative thoughts, we call them cognitive distortions, this surge of stress hormones in our body will take its toll. It is alarming to see how many people in their middle ages are struggling with heart disease, liver and kidney failure, um, diabetes, um, serious anxiety and depression, um, addiction, okay? Because many of those conditions have become chronic as a result of unresolved thinking processes as we are in our middle school and high school uh, years. So our thoughts can manifest themselves in our bodies in very negative and adverse ways that don't just affect us in the here and now, but for years to come. Because you know, today you're being summoned to the principal's office. Uh, in 10 years, you might be called in by the supervisor uh, or, or, or be facing a, a work situation or even in your marriage or with your children. And so it, it, it has the, the, the propensity to, to, to just spiral out of control and create these medical conditions that we're, being, we're treating on the back end when if we learn how to cope, if we learn how to challenge negative thinking, um, we can uh, develop a healthier outlook. Friends, this is a huge takeaway. One of the keys to mental health is learning to challenge our negative thoughts. If our first gut reaction is always to think the worst, if we're not careful, we'll get stuck into a pattern of negative thinking. And it may not be a big deal right now, but over time, with the brain continuing to affect every other part of the rest of your body, it can result in a lot of harmful issues in the future. Ms. Jackie mentioned heart disease, anxiety, depression, addiction, because if we don't do something to deal with this way of thinking, our bodies can and will be affected because our thoughts have a direct impact on our health. So that leads us to our next question. How do we challenge our negative thoughts? How do we make ourselves think differently if our thoughts are damaging us and contributing to our anxiety and depression? A perfect example of guarding our hearts and our minds is given in Philippians chapter four. And there, Paul admonishes the people to rejoice. And he doesn't just say it one time, he repeats it. And again, I'm going to tell you rejoice, okay? Meaning, indicating that joy is a choice. He's not saying rejoice if you have everything under control, right? He's telling the people rejoice, right? And then he goes on to say be anxious for nothing. But if you are anxious, 
pray about it. And, and I'm not, I don't want to diminish the, 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 the need for, for therapy or for medication uh, and, 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 and put it all on prayer. But it makes a very significant impact when we challenge our thoughts, choose joy, pray with a spirit of thankfulness, it, it goes on to tell us that then what happens is that the peace of God, which makes no sense in that moment, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Our hearts, our emotions, our minds, our thoughts. But most importantly, the pivotal uh, coping strategy is found right after that. Shift your focus then on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is kind, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, all right? So when we overthink, we're thinking about the what if. What if I'm going to get in trouble for this? What if, you know, I'm going to get fired for that? But that passage right there is referring to us being able to shift our focus back to what is. What is true in your life right now? Not what if, right? But what is? what is? What is kind around you? What is noble? What is something praiseworthy? What is something lovely? Here, the scripture is giving us the perfect outline for how to conquer anxiety. So how do we change the way we think? How do we start taking steps in the right direction for our mental health? to overcome anxiety, and to really manage what we're going through in these areas. Notice, it's not by telling yourself, stop thinking those thoughts, bad to you. It's by focusing on what's good. It's by choosing to take your focus off of the things you don't know, what you're not sure about, the what ifs, and choosing to focus on the things you do know, what you are sure about, the what is is. Listen to Philippians chapter four, verse eight. This is written here by Paul. Now, you know the story of Paul. He's this guy who, when he first started, when we're first introduced to him, he's a Jewish follower of God, but he hates Christians. He thinks all Christians are liars, and he made it his sole purpose in life to hunt down Christians and have them killed. Now, eventually, Paul had an encounter with Jesus. And here's what's so crazy. By this point, Jesus had already been dead and come back to life. So he had an encounter with a dead guy who was alive again. And when that happened, for Paul, it changed everything about everything. And throughout his life, Paul went through a lot of stuff. Paul was in prison multiple times. He was beaten multiple times for his faith. Paul was shipwrecked multiple times. He was even bitten by a snake. And through all of that, here's what Paul had to say in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And I love that Paul uses that word meditate because we don't do that very often. But meditating is when you pick something and you think about it over and over and over again. And Paul said, instead of meditating on all the bad, meditate on the good. And listen to the way the message translation translates the same, same verse. I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic. Notice it doesn't say think about things that are fake, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Now let me pause for a moment. I understand that not everybody watching right now is a believer. Some of you, your mom's forcing you to watch this. Others of you, your friend made you watch this. I get it, not everyone here reads the Bible, goes to church, but let me just make an observation. The numbers of teenagers your age that are dealing and suffering with anxiety and depression and other mental health issues is skyrocketing in this country. And many of you, you've tried many things You've tried isolating yourself and being alone and seeing if that helps you with your anxiety. You've tried distracting yourself with music, distracting yourself with social media, distracting yourself with video games. Some of you have even tried numbing yourself by taking drugs. Others of you have tried numbing yourself with sex. But I have a hunch 
that even if you've tried reading the Bible, you gave up after just a little bit. You didn't make it a part of your life. You didn't give it time for the process to actually work. Did you know that when a psychiatrist prescribes mental health medication, they tell you that it takes between four to six weeks before you feel any kind of difference. Think about that for a minute. It takes four to six weeks for medicine that was developed by professionals for this one purpose. It takes four to six weeks for you to feel anything different. And then once you're on the medication, they recommend that you stay on it for at least six months before you try to get off of it. And here's my point. Why not try renewing your mind through God's word daily, regularly, multiple times a day. Every time you have a bad thought, not just try it one day and expect yourself to be magically cured. All I'm saying is if you'll give medicine, medicine that God inspired a team of really smart doctors somewhere to create. If you give medicine a chance, why can't you give God four to six weeks of renewing your mind through his word? His word that was inspired by a bunch of poets and writers and kings and priests and historians and even doctors that has stood the test of time and is still here thousands of years later making a difference in the lives of people. Why not give God's word time to make a difference in your life? That's all I'm asking. All I'm asking. Man, I would love, love to pray for you. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we love you. God, you know that there's a lot that a lot of people are dealing with right now. God, in this area of anxiety and mental health and depression and all the things, Father, it feels unmanageable. It feels impossible. It feels like they may feel like they're stuck and like they can never get out. But Father, I just pray that you would help us to actually renew our minds through the reading of your word. That whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, lovely, of good report, of virtue, praiseworthy, we'd meditate on those things. And here it is. There is nothing more true and praiseworthy and good than you. So I pray just for a moment that everybody watching would take their focus for a second off of the issues, off of the problems, and turn their attention to you just for a moment and just meditate on the fact that you are so good. Meditate on the fact that you love us deeply Meditate on the fact that one day you will wipe away every tear from our eye. Meditate on the fact that many are the thoughts that you have concerning us. Meditate on the fact that you know the number of hairs on our head. God, you care about us. The things that bother us, they bother you too. Father, I just pray that right now we would begin a practice of meditating on the things that are good and the things that are true and the things that are pure and the things that are of good report. And as we learn to renew our minds and to think on you, and as we continue to use all the tools at our disposal, that we would get better and better and we would overcome in these areas. And that at some point we'd look back and say, to God be the glory, in Jesus' name. And friends, thank you so much for tuning in. We're so thrilled that you joined us and we cannot wait to see you next week. Bye. Hey, it's me again. Thanks for tuning in and we hope that we see you guys soon. See you guys next week. Bye.